Let's please stand. Father, we surely love you, Lord. We surely met with you already today. Lord, I, I pray that you continue to meet with us during this preaching time and bless our preacher's voice and his eyes today. Lord, bless his lips. Let him say exactly what you had him to say in the manner that you have said. Lord, I pray that none of, none of us that are in this room today would leave in the same manner in which we came. Lord, those that are lost, I pray, would leave saved today. Father, those that are far from you, I pray, would get close again. Lord, those that, uh, Lord, just need a touch from heaven today, I pray that they'd get that. Lord, touch us all where we need it, please. We've, we've come to hear from you through your word, through your man, through your book. And God, I pray that you'd just bless our preacher today. And we lift him up to you, feeling fresh and anew today that we would hear from heaven in Jesus' precious name. Yeah. While you're standing, please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 18. Genesis chapter number 18. I'm going to speak to you this morning on the subject of man God uses. Now, man there is a relative name. In other words, it's, it's, it's to every one of us. It's not just uh, to an individual man. I know that uh, in the uh, Bible translations today, they're trying to change them around to make them gender neutral and all of that type of thing, which is a travesty as far as I'm concerned, uh, to try to uh, make the Word of God palatable because it's never going to be palatable uh, because Man. it's an offensive book. Uh, it's, it's quick, it's sharp, and it, uh, and it even to it its sword, cutting even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit. Uh, that's what the Word of God is supposed to be. It's supposed to be uh, something that gets us to understand where we're at uh, as a human being Amen. and where we need to be as far as God is concerned. Uh, so the man God uses, and I want to speak to you that subject uh, for all of us this morning. Genesis chapter number 18, I begin reading in verse number 16. Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 16 says, And the men rose up from, the, from thence. And looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them all on the way. And the Lord said, "Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I, uh, the thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him." They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. I want to look back at verse number 19, that first phrase, for I know him. Amen. Let's pray again. Father, we ask your blessing upon the message this morning. Lord, I'm just a, a, an earthen vessel, unworthy. And Father, I pray this morning that thou would use me. Yeah. Lord, that would fill me with the Holy Spirit with power. Yeah. Lord, the message that comes forth this morning is not Jim Lamb's message, but the message that comes from the Holy Word of God. Father, I pray that not, not a one of us would leave this service this morning untouched by the words that are, uh, that are inscribed herein. Father, speak to our hearts this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Leonard Gregenhill wrote... Uh, Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was one of the greatest revivalists of the pre-19th century. Leonard, uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards was, uh, uh, was more than just a theologian. He was uh, uh, probably one of the greatest writers sure. of all time. And a lot of the things that we've learned from the Word of God, a lot of the, uh, the strength that we've gotten from the Word of God, has been through things that have been penned by Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards uh, started college at 13 years of age. Can you imagine that? Uh, went to Harvard. In fact, he was the president of Harvard University. I dare say he's probably turning over his grave if he uh, saw what was happening on that campus nowadays. 
Jonathan Edwards uh, penned the, the great sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Mm -hmm. One thing that many people don't know about Jonathan Edwards was that his eyesight was very poor. And, of course, the lighting in the tabernacles and all back then was very poor also. And as he uh, stood in the pulpit th that morning and with a candle on, it, on the lectern, and as he bent over and read word for word, verbatim, the yes, message that he had written out, sinners in the hands of an angry God, people were, uh, were crying out for him to stop so that they could get right with God. Jonathan Edwards was a man of principle. He was a man of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, that you could trust as a child of God. Jonathan Edwards lived, uh, and uh, it was written of him, there was an investigation done, of uh, those successors, 150 years after Jonathan Edwards had left the scene, had passed on from this life, uh, they followed up and they did a, a research of his family and his progeny, those that came after him, and this investigation came up uh, to this. Uh, Jonathan Edwards' uh, heritage there came became 13 college presidents, 65 college professors, three United States senators, 30 judges, 100 lawyers, 60 physicians, 75 army and navy officers, 100 preachers and missionaries, 60 authors of prominence, one uh, uh, vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr, 80 became public officials in other capacities, 295 college graduates, among whom were governors of state and ministers of foreign countries. His descendants did not cost the, uh, the state one single dime. As we think about Jonathan Edwards, and we think about his life and the things that we could probably read and, uh, in history about him, there was also, about the same time, a man that lived, his name was Max Jukes. Max Jukes was a, a prisoner, and uh, it was researched his life also to see what effect did, uh, uh, did his life have on his progeny. And this was the result. He uh, was an unbeliever. He lived a godless life. He married an ungodly girl. And from that union were 310 who died as paupers, 150 were criminals, 7 were murderers, 100 were drunkards, and more than half of the women were prostitutes. His 540 descendants cost the state one and a quarter million dollars. The reason that I share that information with you this morning is because the effect that you and I have upon our ancestors, upon our, our progeny, those that will come after us, is very, very uh, large. We're going to have an effect one way or the other. Amen. Uh, I remember uh, my grandparents so well. I remember my, uh, my grandmother uh, was one of the most loving, compassionate uh, uh, women that I know. Uh, probably, uh, she probably cared for more of the kids and the grandkids and the uh, great-grandkids than anybody else. I mean, she... Uh, every time somebody had a problem, they just always moved home to mama's. And uh, uh, we stayed there numerous times because my dad was in uh, transition between bases and whatever. We always went to mamaw's, and that's where we stayed. Uh, when we had problems, we always went to, to mamaw. And that was the way it was. My, my grandmother, she was just kind of the glue that held the family together. She was the one that, uh, that was the, uh, the matriarch of the family. And I dare say that probably some of the, uh, the things and mannerisms of, that I have and some of the things that I learned, I learned from my grandmother, uh, my great-grandpa Tom. I, I learned some things about him. He was uh, just about uh, uh, three weeks from being 100 years old when he passed away. And Papa Tom had lived in Dixon, Tennessee. We were actually the hillbillies, yes. I mean, sitting on the front porch, barefooted, you know, the whole image you get, blood down the whole nine yards. That's what it was. And the thing that I remember about Papa Tom was that, number one, he had already beaten cancer one time. And as, they, as he was uh, probably uh, in the, in the uh, city of Dixon, uh, he was well known uh, uh, for uh, all over the community. In fact, he was probably one of the pillars of that community. Uh, he had a lot of things. He, he did some other things that probably were not the best things in the world, but uh, he had a great testimony. 
and a great life that he lived. And I remember Papa Tom so well. In fact, I have a picture of uh, Papa Tom holding me when I was two years old. And uh, I remember going to his house and visiting and trying to run through the yard where they had these uh, black walnut trees. Black walnuts are, are spiny. You know, they got a little... And run across that yard barefoot and, and step on one of those walnuts. I mean, it hurt. But black walnuts make the best ice cream. <laughs> Believe me. So anyway, uh, just some of those things. Some of the things that we remember. Probably we could sit back and we could reminisce over the things that, uh, that we learned from our parents or our grandparents or maybe an aunt or an uncle or someone else uh, that would help us, that would benefit us. And so I think God gives us a, a picture and a glimpse uh, into some of these lives to help us to see uh, that not only with the successes come failures, but God always blesses those who trust him. Amen. If we look at the life of Abraham, Abraham uh, was a man that... Uh, that God said in verse 19, he says, I know him, and he says there's three things he knows about, the, about him. He will command his children well. He took oversight of his family. He, he, he made sure that his family were doing the right things. Now, Abraham, if you read, this, read Abraham's life, Abraham was not perfect. In fact, if you, uh, if you took a, 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 a piece of paper and you threw a, a, a line across it and you put uh, the uh, a dot over here for the beginning uh, of the story of Abraham and you put a dot over here for the ending of, of the life of Abraham and then you follow now, all of his successes above the line and all of his failures below the line, his, his line would go just like this. Yeah. And you know, the truth is that every one of us, if we followed that same pattern, and we put a line over here uh, and said this is our beginning and this is our ending. Our, our line would be successes and failures, success and failures. The difference between success and failure is this. Failures are not there to destroy you. Failures are there to help you to see what not to do the next time. Amen. Sure. I mean, we, we, we need failures to help us, encourage us. If we always lived on a mountaintop and everything was always success all the time, we wouldn't see the, the pitfalls. One of the things I like to watch on TV, my wife was watching this yesterday, and, and uh, uh, I came in from the office, and I sat down, we were watching, and we got started on a, on, it's called uh, uh, something bosses, undercover bosses. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. Undercover, undercover bosses, they, they, the, the CEO of the company, uh, will go undercover, uh, disguise himself, will go out into the different stores, different places, uh, and, and see what's going on in, in, within the company. Well, one of those was uh, the Yankee Candle Company. How many of you like Yankee Candle? Can I get a witness? I mean, I've got several of them in my office right now. Uh, Yankee Candle. Now, the, the, the founder uh, and CEO of Yankee Candle uh, grew up in a very, very prominent family. Uh, he went through boarding schools. He went through the best colleges. Uh, he, he had all of the successes. His dad was right there with him. He, he considered his dad the, the best uh, uh, advice giver, the best counselor uh, of his life. And whenever he had a question, whenever he had uh, uh, some business decision to make, he, he always went to his dad. In fact, when he went into the business of Yankee Candle, uh, he went to his dad and said, Dad, I'm going to start a business, and it's going to be called uh, Yankee Candle. And he said, Son, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> People don't use candles on their dining room tables anymore. He said, Oh, Dad, I'm not talking about those kind of candles. I'm talking about scented candles. He said, You're a bigger idiot. <laughs> What are you talking about? Of course, he's built it into a $730 million company. But uh, from that, but he went out into the, into the stores, or, uh, the local stores that he had, and he, he just began to see uh, some of the employees. And what he, what he saw was he, he, the first show man he came to, it was kind of funny because the kid was in there, and he's probably maybe 19 years old, and uh, he, he's his director. He's kind of helping them sit up on the ropes, and they're dipping candles and doing uh, candle sleeves and stuff like that with the hands and all of that. And this kid looks at him and says, yeah, he said, when they do this and the kids come in here, he said, sometimes you just want to slap an eight-year-old right upside the head. <laughs> just tell him this is the CEO of the company, you know. Not a good thing to tell. Of course, he didn't know that. But as, as the story went on, this young man had a very, very difficult life. His dad was a drug addict, an alcoholic, and, and they fall, and they, they, I mean, this, this boy, uh, every penny he had was to try to help his mother 
and, and his siblings to, to succeed. He went to a, a, another area, and this young man was a, uh, he was, had a very strong work ethic. And so he began talking to him, and he was talking about, you know, how good he was at his job and, and all this, and, you know, what's the secret to your success and, and all of this. And, and he started telling him, his, his dad had died when he was eight years old. And he was trying to help his mother raise his sister and pay the bill. Trying to go to school full time and work three jobs. You know, of course, by the time the show's over, I'm in tears because I see what this CEO does. But you see, impacts on lives make a major difference. And the impact on Abraham's life impacted his family throughout. There are three aspects of Abraham's life that I'd like you to see this morning uh, as quickly as I possibly can. I know my time's probably fleeting away. Uh, yeah, it's fled away. But Super Bowl doesn't come on until 6, and church starts at 6, so you'll be all right. <laughs> breathe in, breathe out, you're okay. The first thing I'd like us to see is that uh, Abraham obeyed God. Abraham obeyed God. If you look back into chapter 12 of Genesis... Look at verses 1, to, uh, 1 through 4. It says, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee uh, of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot uh, went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. The first thing that God comes, comes to Abram and says is, Abraham, he said, I want you to leave your family, I want you to leave your house, I want you to leave your city, I want you to leave everything and go where I, where I, I want you to go. Yeah. Nowhere in the text does it say, I want you to go to Canaan. I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to go here. <clears throat> he said, I just want you to get to go. And the first thing that Abraham did was get up and go. Yes. He did not question anything. He just went. You see, if you and I can learn as, as, as the leader in the home, the men of the house, if we can learn just to obey God immediately, just like we intend our children to obey us. Yeah. <coughs> Let me rephrase that. Just like we should intend our children to obey us. I, I get so aggravated for Kevin. If you do that one more time. Yeah. Now if you do that one more time. Now if you do that one more time. It's like a stuck record. One more time. One more time. One more. And, and they keep doing it. Nothing happens. Until finally you get frustrated. You get mad. You get angry. And then you discipline the child out of anger. That's wrong. Yeah. But if you said, son, uh, don't do that, and the next time he does it, you put the Board of Education on the seat of the I guarantee you he'll learn not to do that. Amen. We just spent a couple of days with Brother Caleb and uh, it's Crystal Shipman, and uh, they have a, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And we were sitting at the dining room table at, 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 uh, uh, at Cracker Barrel, and, uh, and Grant was uh, uh, being a little fussy. And he wanted something. His mother told him he couldn't have it. And so he just took his cup and slid it across the table with anger. You say, what would you do? Dad got up. And he picked him up and he carried him off to the car. And then he brought him back. Yeah. You see, he didn't let him get by with that. Olivia would be, would be trying to tell her daddy something while he and I were talking. And he'd say, honey, adults are talking right now. Just wait. But... But it's a conversation. Yes, honey, what is that? See, that's the way we were taught. Yeah. You see, what we're doing now is, is the men need to be the leaders in the home. The men need to be the ones to say, hey, this is the way it's supposed to be. This is what you're supposed to do. This is how it's supposed to be. See, if we would learn to immediately obey God, everything would be right. I want you to look back at a little, a little statement that's made. You probably never have caught it in reading the Word of God, unless somebody maybe have pointed it out for you. But in chapter number 11, in verses 1 through 4, this is where they are beginning to build uh, the Tower of Babel. 
And verse 1 says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they uh, found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn uh, them thoroughly. And they made, had bricks uh, for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Let us make us a name. Now if you go back to chapter number 12, and look what, the, what God says in verse number 2. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. You see the contrast here? Those that are trying to do their own thing and follow their own plan, say, hey, I'm going to do this on my own. I'm making my own plan. I'm following. I'm going to make myself and my family a great nation. Yeah. I've heard over and over and over again, people say, hey, I'm a self-made man. Abraham was not a self-made man. Abraham was an obedient man. Amen. He obeyed God. And he did it instantly. Notice again, in Abraham's life, uh, where he obeyed God. If you look at Genesis chapter 22 and verse number uh, 1. Genesis 22, notice what he says in verse number 1. And it came to pass after these, these things there uh, that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Immediate response from Abraham. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham arose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his uh, uh, young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood uh, for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him of. What I want you to notice is that he immediately obeyed. God said, I want you to do this. I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac. I want you to take him to Mount Moriah. I want you to take him there, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice unto God. And notice what verse 3 says, and Abraham rose early in the morning. He didn't hesitate. He didn't argue. He didn't fuss. He just said, God, I'll do it. You wonder, well, what was going through Abraham's mind? Well, I'll tell you what was going through Abraham's mind. Okay, God, I'll do what you have asked me to do because I know two things. One, if my son, if I take his life, you've got to restore his life again. Or two, you're going to provide. One way or the other, you're going to do it. In fact, go down, let's go down a couple of verses here. Verse number six says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon, his, upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham's old. Isaac's young, probably around 18 years old. And, and you know, and the older we get, the more forgetful we get. The older we get, the more forgetful we get. Did I say the older we get, the more forgetful we get? <laughs> Have you ever walked into a room and looked around and said, why am I here? Come on, get, get, get a witness out here. Come on. If you haven't gotten to that stage yet, you're getting there. Believe it. I like the commercial where the, the, the wet lady walks into the room. She's got her glasses on top of her head and she's looking for her glasses. And she looks at the dog and I, you know, he goes, don't ask me because she won't listen to me anyway. <laughs> I mean, we've done it. And Isaac looks at his dad and says, Dad, you, you've got the fire, you've got the, uh, the, the wood, and, and you, where's the lamb? You gotta, if you're going to have a sacrifice, you've got to have a lamb. The next verse, Abraham says, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a sacrifice. Isn't that amazing? Do you know where Mount Moriah is? It's Golgotha. Yeah. It's right there in Jerusalem. 
It's right there where the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. God provided himself a sacrifice. You see, you, you can't get around the Word of God. You can't get around the, the, the teachings of the Word of God. You can't get around the symbolism of the Word of God. See, Abraham knew, hey, if I could trust him to leave with my family and everything else and go to a land that God wants me to go to, and he's going to make me a great nation, and he's going to multiply my needs, and he's going to give me a son in my old age and promise that my, that my seed will be as the stars of heaven for number and as the sand by the seashore for number, can he not do the greatest thing and provide himself a sacrifice? See, number one, Abraham was obedient. All of us should be obedient to God at the very first step. Secondly, <coughs> Abraham believed God. If you will look at chapter 16, verse number 16. I'm sorry, 16 chapter, chapter 16, verse number 1. And notice it says, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee go unto my handmaid. It may be that I may obtain children of her, or by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took his, uh, Hagar, her maid, to the uh, Egyptian after Abram had uh, dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she uh, conceived, and when she saw that he, she had uh, conceived, her mistress was despised by in her eyes. And Sarah said unto Abram, my, my wrong be upon me. I have given my name unto thy bosom. And when she saw that she had uh, uh, conceived, I despised her. I, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord between me and judge between me and thee. And Abraham said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do with her as it pleases thee. I think I'm supposed to be in chapter 15. But the, let me let me just go. God made Abraham a promise in chapter 15. Abraham sees God. Notice what he says. After these things, back chapter 15, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord, God, what wilt thou give me? See, I go childless. God promises that I will give you seed. Abraham, it says in verse number 6, notice what he says in verse number 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted him. For righteousness, for righteousness. You see, Abraham believed God. God made a promise. Now, granted, Abraham and Sarah got ahead of God. Well, it's not working this way. Twelve years have passed. I, I, I haven't had a child. Hey, why don't we... See, that's the problem that we have in our Christian life. We always want to help God out. Yeah. Well, God, you know, we could do it this way. Wait on God. Wait for God to give. But God's just not answering. God's just not giving. Wait. Twelve years they waited. Twelve years they, they waited on God. And twelve years God did not give Sarah a child. And they tried to help God out. And to this very day, we're fighting battles with Hagar's children. Amen. Yes, sir. To this very day. That's true. This very day, we're fighting those same battles because they got ahead of God. And they said, oh, we, we know better. We can do this better. We, we've got a plan. We've got an idea. It would be much better for you to wait on God and give you the idea than to wait, than to go on your own and mess it up. I've seen this happen so many times. So uh, a, 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 a husband loses a job, and then they start searching around for a job. And they, and they don't seek the pastor's counsel. They don't seek the, the, the word of God. They don't seek anything. They just pack up and move somewhere. They've never checked out the city. They don't know the town. They don't know there's a church there. They don't know anything. They just get up and move. Then they get there and find out, oh, there's no good churches here. 
What am I going to do? So I put my, my child in a church that's not a spiritual church. It's not teaching the Word of God. It's not going to bring my children to salvation. Wow. It's not going to teach them the principles of the Word of God. We're just going to move. I've seen families lose their families doing stuff like that. You see why? Because, hey, we didn't, we didn't ask God. We know better than God. No, Abraham got ahead of God. Messed up. But it still says he believed God. If you will, take show you another example of God where Abraham believed God. Turn to the book of Romans, chapter number four. Romans chapter number four. Notice what it says. And what shall we say then? That Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh, hath fought. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You see, Abraham, he said, believe God. He had faith in God. He trusted God. Perfect? I don't know. But he learned some lessons from his faith. He trusted God. So not only did he learn to obey God, he learned to, uh, to believe in God. But notice the, the, the last thing uh, that I'll share with you this, evening, this morning is this, that Abraham <coughs> was known as the friend of God. If you'll take your Bible and turn to James chapter number 2. James chapter number 2. Abraham had this moniker, the friend of God. Wouldn't you like your nickname to be the friend of God? Yeah. <laughs> when people looked at you and said, hey, hey, there, there, there goes uh, uh, Jason Bowling. He's the friend of God. There goes Lee Cat. Hey, he's the friend of God. I mean, that, that would be a great moniker, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I would much rather have that moniker than, hey, there's Jim Lamb, the friend of Obama. <laughs> There's Jim Lamb, the friend of uh, Pelosi. You know, that doesn't really carry the weight that I would like it to carry. Yes. But you see, the friend of God. Notice, if you will, in James chapter number 2, and look at verse number 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed or counted unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Yes, sir. He was called the friend of God. Now it's interesting <coughs> that when you stop and you consider the fact that Abraham was a nobody, and God said, hey, Abraham, come here. I want you to leave your family, I want you to leave everything, and I want you just to travel. And I, when, when you get to where, I'm, where you're going, I'll let you know. Wouldn't that be, be a great thing? It would be like today saying, hey, uh, uh, Aaron, I'm going to make you a little older than you are. Okay, you get in your car and you just start driving west, okay? <clears throat> when, you get, when you get there, when you get to the going, I'll tell you where you're at, okay? I'll tell you where, you, where to stop. Is that all right? Oh, yeah, that, that'd be great. I'm a young kid. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, no. See, Abraham wasn't a young kid. He was 75 years old. He was established. He had a business. He had, he had cattle. He had family. I mean, he had everything that was attached to him. We said, we have baggage. <laughs> and all of us have baggage. In the military, they, you know, when they're out in the field, they have to bug out. They get a, when they get work, bug out means that they have to pack it all up and be ready to go in a, in a very short period of time. If we, got a, if we got a message today, all of us, that said, bug out, you have 10 minutes, you wouldn't make it. Because, well, I've got to carry my this, and i got to carry my, I'm going to find my iPod, my iPod, my, you know. I know the house was on fire one time, a friend of mine's house, and, and uh, they were there, they are trying to get everything out, you know, trying to get the house, you know, half stirred out and all that. And their son was in the, in the bathroom printing. He couldn't let people see his hair not be in the room. 
the house is burning down around you. Get out, you know. I mean, we are so prideful on certain things. We, we've got to have certain things. But, but God said to Abraham, bug out. And he left. And not only did he leave, he just trusted God all along the way. It wasn't an easy road. But when it came to the very end, it was a, he was a friend of God. I want to show you a contrast here because we talked about contrast in the beginning. James chapter number 4. Never saw this until I started studying this out. But notice this. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. We ask and receive not because we ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever there will, therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy. Yeah. Now he's talking about adulterers and adulteresses there. He's not talking about those that, uh, that are in a, a lifestyle of, of committing adultery. That's how he's talking about people who are religious, people who are believers. Who have adulterated themselves to this world. They said, hey, I'll accept the world. I'll do this. I'll do that. Hey, I'll be, you know, tonight, I'll be watching the uh, Super Bowl. Sorry, I can't be here. <laughs> I'm praying. I am just praying that I don't get so sick that I can't come to church tonight. Because I would not convince anybody that it wasn't to be to stay home. Amen. I mean, I would crawl on my hands and knees yes, from sir. my house to here. To be here tonight. Because I don't want anybody thinking that the preacher missed the house of God for the Super Bowl. Now there's plenty of parties for my, between my house and here already getting set up. They're already making plans for that. But you see, that's the world's thing. That's what the world focuses on. That's what the world is doing. But no, the child of God is not going to be the friend of the world. He's going to be the friend of God. You see, the problems that we have in our life are heaped upon us because of our personal relationship with either the world or God. And you've got to make a decision. Are you going to obey immediately like, uh, like uh, Abraham did? Are you going to, are you going to uh, believe like Abraham did? Are you going to carry the moniker the friend of God? I mean, folks, if you're going to do what's right, it may not be the friend of God that they're going to give to you. It might be Holy Joe. It might be Parson. It might be Preacher. It might be, it, 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 it might be saying that you're holier than, than thou. But all of that comes because of jealousy, because they know that you're doing the right thing. And if you've got the blessing of God on your life, why would we give that up? So that we can have one brief time in this world of enjoyment. Why? Why? You see, the man God uses is the man that's going to obey God, believe every step of the way, and be his friend continuously, every single day. Does it mean you're going to be perfect? No. But when I trip and fall, it's going to be because I have distanced myself from him. And that's exactly what happened in Abraham's life. Every time he got away from God and thought he could do it on his own, he fell. One final thing about Abraham's life. From Genesis 22 upward, you do not see Abraham fall again. Because he was willing to make the sacrifice. Amen. He was willing to do what God asked him. And the, the, the turning point in your life, and the turning point in my life, is the moment that you decide it's God. Whatever He asks me to do, that is what I'm going to do. May we stand for prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your blessing. Pray, Father, that you speak to our heart this morning. Maybe there are some here today, Lord, that, uh, that don't know you. They would die right now if they don't have a home in heaven. 
or I pray they'll step out of the aisle and come and take me by the hand and say uh, that they want to trust Christ as Savior or their life. Maybe there's some here this morning that are saved, but more their life is not characteristic of the things of God. They're following the world. They've got a love affair with, with the world and the things of the world. Lord, I pray that they've come to an old-fashioned altar and do business with you. Lord, maybe there's some that just need to make that decision this morning. Say it's God or nothing. It's Him. Speak to the hearts this morning. Our prayer in Jesus' name. Our heads bowed.